Thought Leadership from PwC. So from an investor perspective, support has really been galvanized. You've had 250 plus investors, 70 to $80 trillion in assets under management that have really rallied um, behind SASB across the globe, you know, 20 plus countries. Continuing our ESG reporting series with a deeper dive into SASB standards, this is PwC's accounting podcast. I'm Heather Horn, and thanks so much for joining us today. The year, 2011. The setting, a rural town on a bluff near the Missouri River in South Dakota, where Gene Rogers, founder and former CEO of the Sustainability Accounting Standards Board, was on a mission to persuade the Siouxland Association of Southern Baptist Churches that the mission of her newly founded organization was going to make a difference in the world. Why did she need to do that? This collection of six churches in South Dakota held a piece of virtual real estate that Jean had determined would be pivotal to the success of SASB's mission, the domain sasb.org. Jean told the SASB origin story on her blog saying sasb.org represented the ultimate legitimacy and instant name recognition. The parallel construction to fasb.org the Financial Accounting Standards Board, which I'm sure you all know, was more than a rhyme. It captured our mission like no other name could. I wanted SASB to develop standards that would enable sustainability fundamentals to be available right alongside financial fundamentals, such that investors could compare performance on critical social and environmental issues and capital could be directed to the most sustainable outcomes. Years later, and after much evolution in the landscape of ESG reporting, SASB standards have become a heavyweight contender in the arena of sustainability investing, earning recognition from major investment houses and private equity firms. So we're excited today to be joined by someone who's been working with SASB since the beginning and focused on helping clients with ESG since years before SASB existed. Briga McNaughton is a managing director in PwC's ESG practice and is here to take us through the world of SASB standards and help our listeners understand how companies are using SASB standards to meet their ESG reporting needs. Brigham, welcome to the show at looking forward to our conversation about the SASB. But before we get into that, very interested to if you could share a little with our listeners about your background and in particular, what you're doing from an ESG reporting perspective. Yeah, thanks, Heather. It's wonderful to be here. Um, so I've spent about 15 years focused on sustainability, ESG, whatever the acronym or term was, you know, o- over the last decade and a half. I really, you know, spend a lot of my time focusing on clients and the intersection between companies and capital markets and how um, transparency and expectations are evolving and how we get uh, better information that's more decision useful, more connected to value at, at an investment grade level. Um, and especially with the dynamic regulatory environment that's happening right now. So before we get into the SASB itself and putting aside the dynamic regulatory environment, because obviously that is changing very quickly, any other sort of big changes you've seen? Because 15 years is a lot longer than most of our listeners would have been focusing on this topic. Yeah, actually, you know, when I started, SASB didn't exist. We were, the the firm was actually fortunate to to work with SASB early on when they were um, getting organized. I think the the key thing that has happened, um, and even more than the regulatory side, more than the standards, is that institutional investors, capital markets, have really stepped up to the table to assert that ESG is important. And to get very clear with their asks around what they expect from companies, whether that's coming through standards or whether that's coming through ratings. And that's really what the driving force is in the market right now that is um, creating the, the momentum. I think the, the regulatory construct is really around how do we make sure that stuff is truthful or standardized or, or useful. But it's really that investor voice that is very different and is accelerated really rapidly. Well, I think, Brigham, you just gave our listeners a reason to keep listening to this episode and, and the entire series. So, because I totally agree with you. I think just the amount of change, even in the past year, we've seen is, is amazing. So this episode, though, is, is intended to dig specifically into the SASB. 
um, which I know also has a new name now, but can you just run through the scope of what's involved in the SASB standards and then we'll get a little into the history? Yeah, when you think about what SASB set out to do, um, it was to create a, a minimum set of standardized disclosures at an industry level. And that was really from a view that what is, quote, material really depends on what industry you're in. So because of that, their standards cover 77 industries, so really expansive set. Um, and we've actually extracted underneath all the standards, all the individual metrics. There's nearly a thousand metrics that are represented across those standards. Now, for any individual company, the expectation is you would pick a handful of the, the standards that um, make sense based on your operations, based on your business model. So you wouldn't be expected to report on you know the thousand metrics, but it's a really large body of work uh, that, that's undertaken. And again, when we think about ESG, there's a big range of topics that could be covered. SASB has really tried to focus on the subset of ESG issues that could be financially material, that that's really where they're focused on trying to create standardized decision useful information. All right. And then I've alluded to this a few times and you started to talk about it. So when and how was the SASB started? Yeah, it goes back to 2011. So w which feels like if you've been in the profession a long time ago, but really in the landscape of, of standard setting, given the, the success in, a, in adoption, that's not a lot of you know time over a decade. Um, Gene Rogers is the, the founder who really had a, a vision and view of you know, materiality at an industry level, had done some um, work in academia around some initial research papers. There was initial funding um, from, from Bloomberg uh, around supporting those standards as, as common infrastructure to be able to support research uh, and, and ratings processes. And then that funding uh, as a nonprofit entity expanded, uh, including PwC uh, eventually. I would say the adoption of SASB standards was really driven by one factor. And, and I talked about this earlier on. That was really um, SASB created this investor advisory group that rallied institutional investors together that then really asserted in their proxy voting, in their stewardship programs, that they expected SASB adoption alongside some others like TCFD as a minimum requirement to be a, an eligible investment as a public company. So Brigham, on that point, I know I hear a lot from clients, I'm sure you're hearing the same thing, that one of the frustrations from companies is, you know, with the alphabet soup and the fact that there is this expectation to report on more than one a framework. And so when you get that question, how do you respond to companies in terms of balancing the fact that maybe all these different investors are looking for potentially different information? Yeah, I think standards are tools and it's really important to be clear on what your problem statement is. So if your problem statement is how do I manage a, a wide set of multi-stakeholder views and to be transparent as a company, it's really clear what the tool is for that. That's GRI, it's not SASB. If your problem statement is how do I um, demonstrate to institutional investors that I understand and care what their priorities are and that I um, want to support providing them with comparable standardized information, then it's very clear that SASB and TCFD are, are the standards for, for that problem set. I will say it gets a little bit tricky with the ESG ratings. So it's it would not be unusual for an institutional investor to tell a company, we need SASB and TCFD, the climate standard, um, for, for us to, to have comparable information for portfolio management, for our stewardship activities, and then at the same time, turn around and launch a, an index fund that's tied to an ESG rating um, that is disconnected from, from any of those standards. So there, there is some really valid frustration at, at the, the landscape that exists. I think for, for most companies at this point, given the pressure um, and discussion and focus around ESG, it's really gotten to a point where you need to make sure that you're monitoring that and that you're resourcing um, effectively to be able to deal with the sort of table stakes expectations on ESG disclosure at this point. So Brigham, definitely think that that is helpful advice. I also think it's one of the reasons that the consolidation is going to be helpful. We're not going to talk about that more today, but in the long run, I think for a lot of companies, they're looking forward to seeing some of these standards come together and hopefully, you know, some more, um, you know, 
clear expectations. One other thing on SASB that I think is interesting is that it was originally really US focused, but now it's much more global, right? Can you touch on that a little bit? Yeah, it's, it's interesting to see the evolution. You asked how things have changed. Thinking about SASB specifically, one of the early dynamics that happened, you know, it was intended for public disclosure, thinking about a framework of SEC reporting and materiality. We actually saw the standards being picked up by private market asset managers first, where they built it into their investment process. So if you're managing a portfolio of investments, you need to quickly figure out which issues are most important for you to be able to engage with them, collect information and data. Um, we, we actually saw really rapid adoption in the private markets of SASB before we saw it in, in the public markets. And then to your point, um, while the standards were really grounded in a concept um, of U.S. securities law, I think fundamentally they represent a thoughtful process to prioritize the issues that are most important by industry. And those industry definitions tend to translate across um, geographies. So we've always seen interest globally in, in the standards. There's certainly um, a dynamic with, with IFRS and the ISSB um, for SASB to, to stretch into a global organization. I will say one of the challenges is if you look through the standards, there are still many metrics that are defined from a U.S. perspective. So, for example, if you're looking in pharmaceuticals and um, safety data, it'll focus on FDA um, observations or, or compliance issues, which is a very U.S. construct. So there's a lot of artifacts in the standards that are embedded that will need to be transitioned to, to be more globally applicable. And then how about one of the things that we've skipped over, but that happened even before the ISSB news was the merger and the creation of the Value Reporting Foundation. So can you give a little background on that? Yeah. And I think this goes back to what SASB was trying to focus on, which was if you look at the whole realm of ESG issues or topics, there are many issues that a broad range of stakeholders will care about. There's a subset that have the potential to impact value creation and be relevant for investors. So the combination um, with the IARC and integrated reporting in SASB was to really bring together the standards that were focused on that subset that was focused towards investors to, to set the stage as one body with one um, set of standards. I think that then set the foundation for um, ISSB, which has carried that forward and brought more of the climate components in, into play to set that stage, but to really try to consolidate at least the the set of standards focused on financial materiality in ESG. So if I'm a user, do I now just see the SASB standards and then separately see the IRC standards or are they one? They're two separate, um, just housed in the same uh, organization. I would think about integrated reporting as more of a principles-based approach to think about how a company could approach telling its long-term value creation story, really in the short, medium, and long term. But that's really thinking about conceptually, how do you describe your business model? How do you describe how you, you um, create value for investors, but also other stakeholders? That's a conceptual framework. SASB is almost on the opposite end of that spectrum where you have very prescriptive metrics that have been defined by topic. And then in terms of the number of companies or others that have adopted it, what's the sort of general landscape there? So from an investor perspective, support has really been galvanized. You've had 250 plus investors, 70 to $80 trillion in assets under management that have really rallied um, behind SASB across the globe, you know, 20 plus countries. In terms of reporters, you went from basically zero in 2015 when the standards were coming out to about 1,200 globally. So a really significant expansion over the past few years. I, I will say, if you look at most SASB reports that companies have produced today, um, it's very rare that a company will sort of by the letter disclose every SASB metric or, or every metric even that they think is relevant. There's still a lot of nuance or customization that companies are doing for their circumstances. So it's almost like, and we'll get into more how to do this, but it's almost like it's a starting point for companies to use, at least right now, from a disclosure perspective versus a sort of um, check the box exercise. That's right, which clearly impacts um, 
the mission of standardization or comparability. Right. So if you were, again, talking to clients, because I know you're talking to a lot of different companies that are new to this, if you were to recommend SASB versus one of the other standards, what are sort of the key points? And you, you touched on this a little, but why SASB versus, say, GRI or TCFD? Yeah, I think if you're a U.S. public company at this point and you have, you know, significant institutional investors, you could name, you know, any of the large asset managers, there's an expectation at this point that you have that that you have adopted SASB. And in fact, I think you're probably in a position where you're you're welcoming a, a distracting conversation or a challenging conversation um, with your board or your management team with large institutional investors at this point. So um, I, I think the conversation with most of my clients maybe a year ago was, should we do SASB or not? Most people have gotten past that. And really the conversation is how or, you know, thinking mechanically about the process. I don't think that there's a lot of um, there's as much resistance at at this point. And I think as people have gotten into the actual reporting, they've realized it's a fairly narrow set of topics for most companies and a fairly narrow set of metrics. All right. And then one of the other questions that comes up is if you start to look at these 77 industries and for our listeners that haven't, I highly encourage you to to check them out and not just your own, but look at some of the others because it does give you, I think, a good sense of what's out there. Um, there. There can be topics that maybe one industry picked up that could be applicable to another industry, but that maybe aren't included in their standards. And so do you see or hear questions around kind of how to handle that? Yeah, it's a great point. And there is on, on SASB's website, um, there's something called a materiality map, which is this really nice heat map across every industry and the um, issues that are flagged as being important. And then you can drill in to see the individual metrics. And it's worth uh, looking at when when we're working with a client around their ESG reporting strategy or approach, we think about it um, almost as a two part problem statement. One part of the problem statement is how do we be responsive to the asks from investors around the standards or ratings that we need to manage. And the other part of it is, what do we as a company think are really the most significant areas and what is our strategy and focus? And therefore, what are the KPIs that we are going to to use to measure our progress? One of the things that we'll do with companies when we're working on that strategic side, so when we work through, we'll use SASB topics, so not necessarily the metrics, along with a lot of other inputs to create a starting frame for what topics could be important for them and then work with their management team, investors, and others to to down select into those that they agree with are important. When we think about the actual KPIs and measurements underneath those topics, a lot of times a company will come up with a, a topic that's not in their standard that they think is important to them or as a management team. And we recommend that you start by considering metrics that are in standards um, even if they're not your standard, first and foremost, as almost a rebuttable presumption before you consider going with your own kind of bespoke measurement approach. And the reason for that is that as you go forward through time, say you want to consider third-party assurance, it's really important to be able to have the kind of independent criteria definition um, over time for you, for you to be able to support that that type of a process. It's much harder to do that with a metric that you've constructed for yourself. Um, so I would say be very clear on what topics are important to you as a company, as a management team, and then use the the standards as a resource for you to think about almost an encyclopedia of potential KPIs. Consider them, but don't hold yourself to them if there's something else that is a metric that's more true to how you're actually managing the issue. Yeah, it's an interesting point, Brigham, because I had Hillary Eastman on and she was talking about her survey that she did of investors. And definitely from an investor perspective, I think there's a a, um, desire to move towards standardization, which you mentioned. But I think what you're pointing out is in the meantime, and as people are um, really starting to get into ESG reporting and to think about what makes sense for their company and everything else, then this is a good resource where they can say, oh, well, maybe for me, water usage is important, but it's not for someone else in my industry or, or you know, whatever the case is. And so it's like you're, you're following this desire for you not to just be making up your own metrics, um, even if it's not necessarily like, let's say, a, a, a metric for your industry in the standards. 
I think that makes a lot of sense. And over time, I actually, I think this challenge will persist because I think there's always going to be a trade-off between what a company itself thinks are the most important issues and what the expectations are to provide some minimum base. And that was SASB's aspiration was always to set a minimum or a floor um, set set of metrics or or disclosures. Even as you go through time, just like with financial reporting, you certainly have your gap financial statements. You have all of your required disclosures. And then on top of that, most companies choose to tell their equity story, you know, in other venues and they'll introduce, um, you know, uh, other metrics, KPIs that are certainly consistent and grounded uh, in those in order to express what their strategy is and how they're holding themselves accountable. All right. Well, why don't we jump in then if someone has chosen SASB as the best framework, what are some of the places that you would recommend they begin in terms of adoption? Again, I know we've kind of scattered this throughout, but I also know you have kind of a step-by-step so we can touch on that here. Yeah. I First, actually, I would just, there's nothing like picking up a peer's report Um, that is adopted SASB or several of them and just laying them out and scanning through because you'll notice very quickly some companies have really robust SASB disclosures where they um, include not only the metric but you know paragraphs describing their processes others where they don't even have it in an index they embed them in a narrative section where they're talking about a, a given topic and you'll have others on the other end that simply use a cross-reference. They have an index in the back and they just say, see page 12 for, for this topic or this issue. So getting a very getting grounded in a very pragmatic view of how companies have actually adopted this, I think is really helpful to bring it to life. Um, but from there, your first decision point is going to be understanding or, or choosing which industries apply to you. So SASB has, based on your you know, overall industry classification, will have assigned you to a given industry. But most companies have multiple segments that operate with distinct issues. Um, so there, there is guidance that SASB has put out, but it's really a, a process with judgment where you'll um, look at the standards that might apply to your largest segments and consider them in the relevance of the, the metrics that, and the topics that are presented in those standards and make a decision under um, the, the span of, of what, met, what standards you're actually going to choose to adopt. From then, you need to start to think about the actual topics that are included. So the way SASB works is that they've gone through a um, multi-stakeholder engagement process, companies, investors, to identify topics that are research-based that they are putting on the table as likely being, quote, material for you. Um, But there is still an option for, for the company um, to make that determination themselves and to go through and consider the facts and circumstances um, of their operations of whether that's really relevant. So there's a, a level before you get into any individual metrics of just thinking through the topics and considering their relevance for, for you and, and your circumstances. Once you get through those topics, then the focus goes goes to metrics. And I, to, I mentioned before um, I do think that there is a, a bit of a, a rebuttable presumption that you would use the SASB metric, um, given institutional investors really are looking for comparability, uh, even if it's not the perfect measure for you. However, uh, as you go through that, if you determine that a KPI uh, you know, that SASB has proposed is irrelevant or not meaningful for you, or um, w- would be false or misleading even in the way that, that it's presented, I think, you know, as a practical matter, most companies are working with the topic owners of the program areas inside their companies to identify how do we measure this today? How do we manage it um, on a day-to-day basis? Most of these issues have mature programs in place and they'll compare um, the differences between what SASB is looking for versus the actual performance management um, measure that they're using internally. And I think investors have been very open to being in that dialogue around why companies have chosen alternatives. And then Brigham, I know this is another place where things are evolving in terms of who's involved in these decisions. So I'm going to have you back and we're going to talk more process. I'm going to try not to dig into it too much here. But again, if I'm a controller or someone in finance who's listening and my company is relatively... 
you know, immature in terms of its processes here, who do you recommend to have involved in, let's not even talk about developing the metrics themselves, but designing your report and deciding, making these decisions that you just uh, talked about? Yeah, for a lot of companies, if you're fortunate to have a sustainability office or an ESG team, they have typically been in the driver's seat uh, in, in preparing these disclosures. Sometimes that could have been a, a communications or somebody in a you know ad- administrative office function um, with support from finance or controllership, thinking about data quality and controls and how you get that to be accurate. Today, I think there's a recognition that this is a very cross-functional exercise. So we are seeing lots of working groups, steering committees, where you have um, control function. So at a minimum, having legal, uh, your finance organization, controllership, uh, if you have somebody in a seat for ESG or sustainability, potentially internal audit at a table together. And then it's really driven by the topics in your standard. Um, So depending on your company and where you operate, you may have you know subject matter or executives that have oversight over water usage or climate data or health and safety or product quality or um, pricing. Uh, that that'll be a little bit organic based on the topics that are important uh, for your industry. Okay, one more question, sort of from a des- report design perspective, and again, try not to get too much into the data. But I know, again, for many companies, whether they've been doing this for a while or not, because of increased demand for more and more information, there may be a case where, let's say, it's you know, you have eighty percent of what you want to report, but there's missing metrics. Mm-hmm. Then, do you recommend to a company? like go ahead with the 80 or how do you recommend companies deal with that where maybe they don't have everything that ultimately they would like to report in the future? So in practice, we've seen a wide range. So we have seen companies um, that will report the whole standard and they will literally put in, you know, a description saying information not available, or maybe even indicate when information might be available Mm. in the future or where they've explained why they don't think it's relevant and taken a position. Um, there are other times where we have clients who have, who will only have the, so you'll take a SASB standard and they will only show the metrics or the topics that they've chosen to report on. Um, I, I think that could be a more challenging approach for investors. I think it's more transparent to, to present the standard and to, um, be able to explain either that data is not available or it's not relevant and to be open and transparent about that versus um, just selectively picking you know, topics out. Um, I do think that we're, we're at a crossroads here as a, as a industry, as a practice where fundamentally uh, underneath the SASB standards, they're defined as potentially material from the perspective of, of the SEC. Most companies today do undertake something called a materiality assessment for sustainability reports, but it's really grounded in that GRI framework and process, which is we look at a multi-stakeholder set of perspectives. We try to identify the issues that are most significant and relevant. Uh, When you and I think about materiality in the lens of SEC reporting, we're thinking much more about what the impact could be on current or future Mm -hmm. earnings, um, financial condition. We're thinking about trends, events, uncertainties, risk factors. I think we're at a crossroads where um, climate is going first, where clients are are having to take a bit more of a position on the true financial materiality of climate change and the disclosure obligations underneath that. I expect that will over time have to follow for the rest of SASB metrics and topics as they move through this process and get a little bit cleaner on what they actually mean when they're reporting on these topics and therefore implying that they are material or significant for their company and their circumstances. Does SASB include then a specific definition of materiality for use with the SASB standards? Yes. So they rely on the overall Supreme Court definition um, which is that total mix uh, of information that, that's avail- available and whether it would impact the decision. It's really a, a fraud standard. So it's mm-hmm. not great um, and it's not particularly decision useful, but they've 
Sasby has gone to lengths to say you should treat materiality similarly to you as you would in any other financial reporting. And that's different from the Global Reporting Initiative, for example, which has an explicit definition of materiality that is grounded much more in a multi-stakeholder concept. Well, I think uh, materiality in the context of ESG reporting is probably something that could be its own episode in terms of the pros and cons and all of the different views. So I think it's helpful at least to understand in dealing with the SASB standards, some people, again, if I go back to like why SASB, some people may at least for now actually think that this is a plus that it's focused on sort of the financial, um, the same definition as the financial reporting standards. Uh, especially if they're, you know, just dipping their toe into some of this. Yeah, it's interesting. And this goes back to you to ask me at the beginning, what the biggest change has been over the last 15 years. And my answer was, you know, the pressure from institutional investors as a, as a clear um, driver uh, of reporting practices in this space. The interesting point, what we find over and over again, if you're a company that has a mature sustainability program, you've got goals and targets, you had those in place because you had other reasons beyond investors that you created those programs. You've probably struggled more with SASB than companies who are starting now. And they're starting because they're hearing it from their institutional investors, much less resistance to looking at the standards and adopting them. Um, and thinking about investors as a primary audience. That's a, a very real dynamic that we see play out all the time. So looping back, I think that's a great point. And looping back then to my other question, it sounds like, again, if I'm only you know reporting some information now or I, I'm not really reporting much and I want to start reporting, you would recommend this is not a case where you should wait to be, let's say, perfect in terms of like I have every data point for every metric that's um, relates to my company. But if you've got, in my example, 80%, start reporting your 80% and then build towards adding to that. Is that a fair summary? That's been market practice for now in the current landscape. I do think the regulatory environment around this is changing and we expect um, o- oversight, enforcement, supervision will change on this. So I would say Slight footnote or caveat to that is, A, make sure that whatever you're saying, you've got enough controls and processes, that it's a truthful statement. I, I think when when companies speak publicly, they've got a duty for that to be a, a true statement. Um, so that, that's one part. And a very then, important one. Thank you for that. <laughs> and then when you're choosing not to report on something, I do think it's important to have a conversation internally around the reason for that. And if the reason for it is that you don't have the information, it's not something that's been relevant for you. That's one thing where I think it makes complete sense to be open about that uh, and um, be transparent about that. If the reason is because you're uncomfortable with the position that that would put you in, then I think you should consider internally you know, what that rationale is and have a conversation about what that means in terms of... Um, whether your total ESG disclosure is misleading if it's absent. All right. Definitely good points. And I think to your first point there, you know, all of this is in the context for SEC registrants of the existing rules for SEC registrants in terms of disclosures. And then we've talked before on this series about the fact more are expected. Um, But so I do think it's a good reminder, you know, to be thinking about that. But also if you are creating a sustainability report to make sure that the information is consistent between your SEC reporting and your sustainability reporting. Absolutely. And we are finding, so as I mentioned before, I think climate is going first. The SEC has been very clear um, on their focus on climate and human capital and cybersecurity in in the near term. What we're finding in climate change, um, you may have a carbon disclosure project response where they ask you specifically, is climate change a significant risk or opportunity for you? A lot of our companies have said yes to that. Um, in that investor-facing disclosure. And then they might have a ESG report with a materiality assessment where climate change shows up prominently in that um, materiality assessment or disclosure or document. And then you might have a securities filing where you have an obligation, for example, in MDNA around known trends, events, and uncertainty, um, where climate change is not represented or discussed. And I think having a, that cross-functional team internally to think through 
all of the different ways that you're speaking or representing and making sure everyone's comfortable with the implicit, implicit judgments that you've taken to substantiate how and why your disclosures might differ across documents. So I, I think it, consistency is important, um, but it's actually okay to have inconsistent disclosures as long as there's a thoughtful rationale that depending on um, the facts and circumstances of the audience and the, the disclosure that is important to that audience, but that you've determined consciously that it's not important or material for a different audience. All right. Well, and I think that's um, a good reminder that documentation is always important and making sure that you have that. And again, I'm going to have you back uh, to talk some more about controls just ac across the board and reporting and not just for SASB, but maybe just wrapping up SASB then as you're meeting with companies, anything else that's sort of top of mind that we haven't touched on today as, as people are working with these standards? I would recognize that there are evolving and that um, expectations from institutional investors are moving really, really quickly. And there are some areas of the standards that um, aren't at a place that they will actually meet institutional investor expectations. So what I mean by that, n number one, we I think at this point, there's a conversation around diversity, equity, inclusion, and human capital more broadly that institutional investors expect companies to be transparent around. That's really underrepresented in SASB standards today. There's working groups and processes in place to to evolve um, what that looks like. But I think just recognizing that structurally, that's an area that's going to be quite dynamic uh, in the standards. Similarly, on the climate change side, um, there are only certain industries will have a climate change topic and metric included in the SASB standards. Most institutional investors have taken the position that they want a full-throated conversation on climate change and climate risk, and they want emissions metrics. So there, there's some context around particularly diversity, broader human capital, um, and climate change that may not be embedded within the standards or represented in, in the actual metrics for your industries. All right. That's a, another great reminder. So then, Brigham, if someone is listening and they do want to know more, you and I both talked about kind of reading the standards, but what do you recommend for people as they're trying to get up to speed? Yeah. So SASB has implementation guides. I think they're they're useful and helpful. Um, if you're looking, if you uh, have been told by someone in your organization that you're going to spend a lot more time with SASB, they actually do have a credential, which is helpful, but it is um, time time intensive. Uh, so that's not for the, the casual uh, SASB visitor. Um, they also produce case studies as well um, that, that I think are, are useful. Beyond that, I truly think there's, there's no replacement to really just spending time with actual reports that are out in the market at, at your peers and getting an appreciation for the nuance of how people have addressed the standards. All right. Well, Brigham, very interesting and appreciate all your insights. Thanks so much for joining me today. Thank you. That's our show for today. Join me back here next week for a new lineup of podcast episodes. On Tuesday, we're continuing our What's Trending in SEC comment series with a focus on md &A. And to close out the week, on Thursday's Talking ESG show, we're going to talk about how to determine what to report and more specifically, what framework or frameworks to use. And for a bonus, look for an episode from us on the recently completed AICPA conference on SEC and PCOB developments. So they never miss any of our audio content. Follow the PwC Accounting Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. And to stay up to date on all our latest accounting and reporting news, sign up for a newsletter at viewpoint.pwc.com. From thought leadership at PwC, I'm Heather Horn. Thanks for tuning in. This podcast is brought to you by PwC, all rights reserved. PwC refers to the U.S. member firm or one of its subsidiaries or affiliates, and they sometimes refer to the PwC network. Each member firm is a separate legal entity. Please see www.pwc.com slash structure for further details. This podcast is for general information purposes only and should not be used as a substitute for consultation with professional advisors.